And now we're going to start looking at little chunks. We've been through these big narratives, but we're going to look at uh, these individual judges. So uh, as an overview, the story of judges is a story of a God who is consistently faithful to his promises, while man is consistently unfaithful to his obligations. And so that's the constant tension in the book of Judges is God's faithfulness and man's unfaithfulness, and then us struggling with the sort of the chicken and the egg, which one comes first, which one uh, has implications on the other, so on and so forth. Which, you know, if you've been here for each of these times, you start working that out. You start recognizing that God is always faithful, although our response to our obligations uh, determine the way that we, what's the key word, experience his faithfulness. And that's what we have to get into our mind. We have to remember that. So, all right, Judges chapter 3. So pick up a very familiar beginning, verse 7. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Remember I told you the Baals are uh, false gods of uh, harvest. They're agricultural gods for the most part. The Asherahs are female gods that uh, lead to all sorts of horrible sexual immorality and everything else. So they got mixed up in all this kind of stuff. And uh, now at this time, it's important for you to understand that Mesopotamia, which is made up of several groups, but the Cushites being one of them, was the most powerful of all the people who lived in the Promised Land. Remember, there's all these ites that are still in there. There's the Hivites and the Jebusites and all a bunch of them that are still all interspersed amongst God's people because uh, the children of Israel weren't faithful in running all of them out of the land as they were commanded to. And so now God has allowed them to dwell together, which has now led to all of these troubles. But the most powerful of them all, remember we talked about last week how the children of Israel were, were like these extreme simpletons as they entered into the promised land. They had been living in the desert, basically tent dwellers, living in the desert completely dependent upon God. But when they entered into the promised land, they encountered and got, got uh, uh, intermingled with a very, uh, you know, forward-thinking culture. So basically civilization. And so... Uh, these people were very much more advanced than the children of Israel, and so they were enamored with all the new things, all the new toys that were around them. So once again, God's people don't do what he told them to do, and they do what he told them not to do. It's not just that they're disobedient to the command, although if God... If God tells you to do something and you don't do it, it doesn't really matter what you do, you're still completely unfaithful. But the point here is that not only do they not do what God asked, but the very thing they end up doing is what he warned them not to do. So he didn't just give them a command, go into the land and drive out the people. Knowing what was going to happen, the omniscient God of the universe said, go into the land and drive out all the people. And if you don't, don't do this and this and this because this and this and this are going to happen, which is exactly what they ended up doing, which is exactly what ended up happening. Now remember, last week we saw that God's anger is faithful. It's a faithful anger that represents his great love for his people. So last week we really focused on how God's anger is not something to be taken back by, but it's, some, it's really that we should be grateful for it because the way that one of the ways that we know God loves us so intently is because he is a God who is jealous. He's a God who hates what uh, destroys us. And so that's a reminder of his great love for us, that the opposite of love is not hate, but it's indifference. Thank you. So what you would never want is a God who is indifferent. That would be horrible. Okay, so here again we see God acting as a good father in that he watches his children disobey over time. You know the expression, I use this expression all the time, I'm just giving rope, right? That's a horrible expression, the rest of it. I just say the first part, I never say the second part, but you're just giving rope, right? And so 
because it, it's just, you need to give rope because sometimes if you don't give rope, then um, basically lessons are never learned. You're too, you're, uh, you're too overbearing as a parent or as an authority figure and then not, nothing ever happens. So you're giving rope, so he's doing that, and then he patiently endures their unfaithfulness while showing them mercy and kindness. In other words, God is so good to them the whole time that they're in utter rebellion to him. He's good to them for long periods of time. Then he eventually has enough, as we're going to see. All the while, he's calling them to repentance. You see, he's not... It's everything with God, as far as chastening is concerned, is always pointing towards repentance. You know, all of these little lessons that you have learned over the years from just this relentless repetition of me saying certain things over and over and over so that they just drive into our head because they're unnatural to believe. And one of those is that God is not punitive. He's not punitive in his uh, uh, punishment. Okay, God doesn't punish us for the sake of punishing. He, doesn't, he never does that. And so that's the point I'm making here. All the while, he's calling them to repentance. It's always pointing to repentance. Whatever God's doing is never to drive us further from him, always to bring us closer to him. So sometimes you have to have surgery to get well, right? So we don't enjoy the surgery, but we have to have surgery to get better. So God sometimes puts us in the uh, surgical room for us to get better. But it's always with the point of getting us better. It's not punitive. It's not to hurt us. So it's shocking to consider how mankind responds to the patience of a holy God, how we take his immeasurable kindness for granted. It just makes me wonder that as years are passing, as the children of Israel enter into the promised land, it's not like they don't know that they're being disobedient because they, they all know. You know what I mean? This is the generation that heard it straight out of the mouth of Joshua. They all know what God has told them not to do. They all know that they're doing it, right? So you have to wonder. I have to imagine in my, my head, are there not times when they're, they're sitting around or, you know, maybe in the, in the confidence of maybe their own families or close-knit groups of people, are they not having conversations with each other like, you know, it's shocking that God just doesn't kill all of us. I mean, I think that's what, you know, they'd be saying. You know, or, you know, uh, before things start, you see, because when things start getting bad, then everyone gets keenly aware of their sinfulness. Whether it has anything to do with God or not. Right? So, a group of people who don't think about God ever, uh, who are sitting in a house having a hurricane party to ride out the storm, when the surge, when the 20-foot tidal surge comes through, suddenly are extraordinarily conscious of the possibility that maybe, right, everybody starts praying and then starts thinking things that they don't want. Is God trying to kill me? Maybe I should have listened to him. They're having all these crazy thoughts but they're keenly aware of God in the crisis. But the people of God are keenly, we're aware of God in our rebellious mode. So like if you were with a group of other people and you were being unfaithful to God with other people who profess to be Christians, it's not like everyone there doesn't know that what they're doing is wrong, right? Yes. Or even if it's iffy. You know it's iffy. No one wants to say anything, but you know it is. So it's that awkward moment when, you know, you're with a group of people and then, you know, somebody starts using language that's inappropriate, but nobody's really sure what to do or how to say anything. or You know, you just kind of, it's this weird moment, right? And everybody knows that that's, you know, not a good thing, but, you know, you just sort of, and it makes everybody weird. Well, I'm just saying it's got to be that way for the children of Israel as they're in the promised land. They, they, 
I mean, they, they, they're watching all their children intermarry with all these new people. They're, they're, they, they, it's not like they don't know that they're, going, they're worshiping these bells and these asherahs. They know all this. So they can't, how could they not see the patience of God? And then I just look at the United States right now, and I go, really? How in the world can we not see the patience of God? It's shocking to me that we as a people, I mean, you, you can't even turn the TV on right now without people that are literally, they are marching and screaming and yelling for their agenda. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with you and me and what we believe. It has nothing to do with that. At the core of what it is, God has said certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And we as a people are just, we're just, we're drifting off of our moorings completely. And you have to wonder, how long will the patience of God, because let me just clue you in, if, if Judges is going to teach us anything, one of the things it's going to teach us is, right now, God is being patient. If God stops being patient, nobody is going to be wondering if God's stopped being patient. You're going to know when he's done being patient. So it's just shocking. It just shows you about mankind. I mean, I just want you to see this. It's almost like I feel like that we see ourselves in this passage of Judges. Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? My goodness. When we understand the weakness of our flesh, here's what happens. We will understand our need for God to be merciful to us, our need for God to be angry with us in order to save us from ourselves. Judges is really teaching us that if we listen to what Judges teaches, what we come to the conclusion of is that we need God's mercy, but we also need God's anger. Because if God doesn't get angry, we won't change. Now, don't you see that playing out around us? Yeah. You think the United States is going to make a, you think we're going to, our culture is going to make a, an about face, a U-turn on its own? It ain't going to happen. But if the anger of God comes, things can start changing in a, in a hurry. But we, I don't want that, but here's the point. What I want is, I want salvation. In an Old Testament sense, they want literal physical salvation. In a New Testament sense, we want salvation for the people. We want, we want revival. All right, so here's what happens. Verse 8. Man, we only, it all that was just one verse. Here we go. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Now understand, years have passed. We're not talking about weeks or months. Years. God's just been watching, just letting the rope out, letting it out. It's hot against Israel. So he sells him into the hands of Cushan Raphadim. Now this guy is the Mesopotamian king, who is basically the most powerful person on earth, because he leads the Cushites. And the Bible says that the children of Israel served Cushan Raphadim eight years. Now, his name means the Cushite of double wickedness. That term, hyphen, rasha, rashthaim, that is double wickedness, which I think is fascinating because, you know, names always mean something in Scripture. They always mean something to God. So then also, what it shows is double wickedness in that we see God using wickedness to punish wickedness. That evil is one of his tools. 
Now it really gets dicey when you're watching the news and you're thinking about all this. Okay? Now here's the question that people ask. How can God, how can this holy God use evil? How can he use evil? Let that just bother you a minute. Get it all over you. You got this holy God who has now used this pagan, wicked king to, as a tool of chastisement for his children. So here's the answer to the question. How can he not? Well, my question would be, what would you like God to use? I have had multiple people bring this up, uh, skeptics, in conversation as I'm talking to them about the Lord. How does this God, who's so just and so holy, how does he use evil as a tool? To which my response is always the same thing. Okay, I'm all ears. I cannot wait for you to answer this question. What would you like him to use? Silence. There's no way to answer that question. Why? Because, hmm, let's think about it. The most evil thing that ever happened was the death of Jesus, yet it was the greatest tool ever used in all of history. Right? So even in the redemption of the world, God used evil. He used evil Jews. He used evil Gentiles and the Romans. He used evil people. People who... So the, 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 the hands that held the hammer, that nailed the nails, God created. The hands that slapped him in the face, God created. The spit that was going on his face, God created. That every single person who was abusing the, the Son of God was created in the image of the one they're abusing. It's all, all evil. And yet God uses that as his tool in the greatest act in the history of the universe. So now, let's just clarify this, make it very, very simple. There are only two things that exist in the universe. When you boil it all the way down and you're just going to separate it into the, 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 the minimum possible groups, here's your groups. One, there's a good holy creator. By the way, if you don't know, that's the small group. Number two, there's bad, broken creation. And that's the only two groups. Everything is in one of those two groups. Nothing's in the middle. Nothing's in a third group. They're only in those two groups, right? Hmm. Okay. So then if that's true... God only has wickedness to work with. That's why I always say, what would you like him to use? There's, what, what other tool is there? Let's see. Group number one consists of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay? Group number two consists of everything else in the universe. What would you like God to use as a tool? Wickedness is his only tool. Every tool that he's ever used and will ever use will always be wickedness until the new heaven and the new earth because that's all there is. Even what we would consider, I mean, you see how, how crazy it is to think about this because you got to kind of go, so you would say to yourself, okay, so, so why doesn't God use the church to as a tool to solve the problem. Okay, fine. That's still wickedness. See, the assumption in our mind would be like the church, like it's spotless. Well, when did that happen? I mean, as long as I'm in the church, it's not that way. I mean, I'm not talking about you, it's talking about me. We're tainted. Everything he uses is tainted. Everything. Because he's the only thing that's not in some way tainted. Okay, so you got the scene. 
The children of Israel do what they're not supposed to do. God responds. His anger's hot. Now he's, he's brought this uh, king in. And for eight years, the king rules over the people. Then the first judge comes, verse 9. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Verse 10, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord delivered Cushan Rephaim, king of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over the king so that the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. There's a lot in that little bitty part. Okay, let's work through this. First of all, God gives a spanking to the nation, and like a good spanking, it hurts. See, if you spank, in my house, my wife has a rule. You don't spank when my kids were small. You never whip the spoon out until you're ready to use it. And if you use it, you got to use it. And her mom taught her that because if one of my kids, or the first time one of my kids got a spanking, I'm not going to name the, the one he is, but when he, <laughs> when he came out of the room and he was like, nah, 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 you know, mama said, back in the room, partner. And then Lisa came out and she said, Back in the room, Mama. So God doesn't, he, he, he knows how to spank. So if he whips the spoon out, you're fixing to feel it. So that's what he does. And now, they do not cry out because they came to their senses or they realize that they're wrong. They cry out because they're in pain. The only reason they're crying is because they got a spanking. And on top of that, isn't it interesting? How long does it take them to cry out? Eight years. You see, the Mesopotamian king comes in for eight years. And then the Bible says the people of God cried out. And as soon as they cry out, God responds in mercy. It's just shocking. It's shocking. Every time you read the Bible and the people of God cried out, the very next verse is, and then God responds, God responds, God responds. Now again, we're back to experiencing it, right? Now God has promised to never leave them or forsake them, right? Has he left them or forsook them? No. He's right there with them. And when they cry out, he's right there to respond. And when he responds, it's not what they were thinking, was it? No, but he's there, and he's responding, and he's keeping his promise, and he's doing everything that he said he would do. But their experience of that is utterly different than, listen, had they gone in and done what they were supposed to do, God's promise would have still been achieved, the end result would have still been the same. But look at all the pain they would have spared themselves. Huh? How many of us look at our lives and say, like me, how many of you would say, oh, man, if I, I'd give anything if I could have, if God would have saved me when I was eight or nine or ten. Think of the pain I could have saved myself. Think of the suffering I could have not had to endure. But, so, it's not, it has nothing to do with his promise. It's all about the experience of it. So what does God do? He hears them. Eight years go by. He hears them. They cry out. He sends this man, Othniel. He's a family man from Debir, which is a pretty much nowhere town, to be the deliverer of Israel. Don't get thrown off by the word judge, okay? In the Bible, a judge is like a leader. Is a, so he's a military commander. Or they're, they're, it's not just somebody who's judging as in like bringing judgment. It's a judge as in somebody who's orchestrating God's um, uh, plans. He's putting forth. So it's different than a prophet, but, but similar. 
So who is this Othniel? How do I know he's a family man? Well, the Bible gave us a hint about his dad who should have rung a bell. Then it said it was the, he's the younger brother of who? Caleb. Now, remember back in chapter 1? There was a little phrase in chapter 1 that, that we went through, but we didn't stick on because I knew that we'd come back to this moment. When Caleb said something about his daughter, he said, now, whoever goes into this land and takes this land, I'm going to give my daughter. Remember her name? I think so with an A. Remember that conversation? Okay, so he said, whoever, whatever mighty man goes in, takes over this, defeats his people, they can have my daughter's hand in marriage. And who goes in and does it? Othniel. So what does that mean? He married his, well, it wasn't his, uh, right, his cousin. So now he's married to his cousin, which is, don't panic, we're in the Old Testament here, okay? We have it, we have it blossomed out into the, the Gentiles aren't, aren't in the story yet, okay? So everything's okay. God's protecting all this. So, we know some things about Othniel. Now, when that happened, uh, God gave her, or not God, Caleb gave her this land. What I didn't tell you about that land is that it's a desert. It's not this jam-up piece of land. It's a big desert, but it's a piece of land nonetheless. Then she comes back to Caleb, the Bible says, all this in chapter 1, you go back and read it, and she gets down, remember, I, you'll remember this part, she gets down off her donkey. And I made fun of that, remember? I'm like, now that's a woman. She gets down off her donkey and says, Dad, I'm grateful for the land, but can I have some uh, of the springs, of the, of the lush area where the springs are? And so Caleb grants her like 21 springs or something like that. And so it tells you something about... I, when I read that, I think I'm going to preach a sermon on that one day. Because she's, she gets this gift that on the outside looks kind of like a bummer. But she's grateful in her heart and she handles it the right way and she t goes to her dad and she doesn't say, hey, why'd you give me that junky land? She says, thank you for that land. I appreciate it very much. Could I have some spring also? And so God blesses her and gives her this. So she ends up with this unbelievable gift. And it's really a, so now, Othniel, we find out, okay, so this is her husband. So this is their land now. So we know that he comes from this, from good stock. He's a faithful man. He's in Caleb's family. His name means God's strength. So we already know he's a tough guy because he already went in there and whipped his people and got the, the land. So he's like Caleb. Caleb was a bad dude. Him and Joshua were, I mean, you just, whoever crossed those two lost. They were tough. So the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. That's what the Bible says. The Spirit moves on him to respond to God with action, to step into a fight with impossible odds, and to do so without fear. All right. Now, without God's Spirit, men tend towards what is right in their own eyes. They, they depend on themselves, and they experience defeat after defeat after defeat. Even when there's victory, uh, momentary victory, ultimately, apart from the Spirit of God, it always ends up yielding defeat. I mean, there's always defeat in that. So God sends His Spirit upon Othniel, who has seen some victories in the past, but who wouldn't be able to do something like this. This is completely different than just fighting your own battles or being a tough and great warrior. This is leading a people. So he's judging the people. So he's not only, this isn't just militarily, this is ethically. He's having to deal with everything. 
spiritual leadership, all these arenas of leadership. So he becomes kind of like a, like a military commander and a high priest at the same time. So now what is Othniel? This is all we know about it. Yet, what does this teach us about God? All right? The Spirit does not come upon Othniel because he is special, but because God is sovereign. The Bible says that it, God sent the Spirit upon him. Not that he deserved it, not that he noticed the, that God doesn't tell us any reason behind, any rhyme or reason. We just happen to know these things about him. But I'm not telling you this is why he's the one that God chooses. I'm just saying that God chooses him. That's what God does. And that he's really not anything special. Nor really are any of the judges for the most part. So it's just a matter of the sovereign God. Now the Bible is not a story about faithful men and women living faithfully so they can save themselves. This isn't a situation like Job where God says, now Othniel was the most righteous of all the people on earth. No, that's not what we got here. We just got this guy. So that's not the story, but the story is about billions of faithless people and one faithful man, the Lord Jesus. Now, I think there's more than the, what I'm about to go through, but I'm just going to point out these one, two, three, four, five things. And, and again, I want to stress the fact that I don't, we don't know anything about Othniel. This is all I know is what I've told you. It's all that can be known. Yet, I want you to see the detail to which God goes to. Like Othniel, Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Othniel comes from the tribe of Judah, which is the chosen tribe. That's not an accident. That's Caleb's tribe. Like Othniel, Jesus arrives after a relative who goes before him. You see, when I first started studying this, my first question is, why did he pick, why, why did he pick Caleb's younger brother? And then I thought about it. Oh, I see. He's just setting this pattern, right? Jesus comes on the scene after who? Uh-huh. Okay. Like Othniel, he's a fa he, Jesus is a family man from an obscure town. De Beer is What do I always say? The, the socia of... Uh, I just like the reaction I get. Butch always gives me the stink eye when I say that. Okay, so, I mean, De Beer, really? That's where he, Okay, hmm. And like Othniel, Jesus' ministry begins with the Holy Spirit descending upon him, right? Same way. And then the Bible says, like Othniel, Jesus gives us rest, but the difference would be one that never ends. But that's where the similarities end, isn't it? Because the way, excuse me, the way in which Othniel uh, accomplishes this rest is the opposite of the way Jesus does. No, no leader, there's no correlation in leadership to Jesus and somebody else. Forget that. Never. Nowhere. There's no pattern. There's no, mm -mm, nobody. He's in a category of his own. He did everything in reverse. He did everything the opposite of what we would think. He had all the power and all the authority and all the might, and yet he sat there silent like a lamb before the shears. Yeah. He could have done anything he wanted to do at any time with the flick of his pinky finger, but he didn't do that. See, he, he, he ushered in a kingdom that everything is reversed. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Whosoever among you desires to be great, let him be your servant. Everything's in reverse. So there's, when it comes to the 
the the the leadership style or the way something's accomplished. Jesus is in his own category. But all of these little details, now why does God do that? Why doesn't God raise up people who lead like Jesus led? Simple answer, because that's impossible, because men can't do that. So then the question would be, okay, why does, G, why does God raise up people in the same ways with these little clues? Why does Othniel come from Judah? Why does Othniel is preceded by a relative? Why is Othniel, the Holy Spirit comes on him the same way? Why all those things? Yes, in other words, he's trying to say, hello, this is the Messiah, King. don't you, how do you miss this? He, he makes Jesus so obvious that you'd have to be blind not to know it. Right? That's why. Okay. Now, what does Othniel teach us about us? About us. God intends to use us. He wants to use who we are. He wants to use what he has made us to be. He wants to use all the things that we've experienced. He even uses all the things that we've done. We should just sit here for a second, let that soak in. You know, it's one thing to write D-O-N-E, it's another thing to let that settle in on you for a second. This isn't disqualifying us. No, no. He's using that all for what? His glory. All for His glory. So, the principle that comes out of this is that nothing can succeed without God. But then on the flip side of that, That every person, everyone, is a tool for God's glory. There's a, Othniel is a great source of encouragement. Now let's think about Othniel as a tool for God's glory, and then let's think about this room right now as a collection of Othniels. All these different Othniels in this room, all these different experiences, all these different paths, all the different characteristics, the uniquenesses that make up all the people sitting around all the tables in all this room, as God desires to use you as a tool for his glory, each tool is different in its own way. It's unique. Othniel is not like other people. He's Othniel. He's just a guy with a weird name. But he's who he is. I think the Bible goes out of the Judges goes out of its way to say to us, this is basically ordinary Joe in every way except for the ways in which God used the circumstances to point towards the coming Messiah. But apart from that, I mean, but without God, they're just tools lying on a workbench good for nothing. See, you, you may be somewhere on the spectrum tonight of thinking of yourself as not usable for whatever reason, that God won't use you, can't use you, you just won't for whatever reason that, that you know, you've been condemned into thinking or, or whatever condemnation is on you, all the way to the other end of the spectrum, maybe that in, in some prideful way you're upset with God because you're not happy with the way he has used you or he hasn't used you to your full potential that you think you have or whatever the case may be. I want you to just look back on your paper at verse 10. Let's look at verse 10 for a second. I want you to underline a couple of things and then you're free to go. Verse 10. You see verse 10? 
The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and underlined, he judged. Small h, he judged Israel. Under, underlined, he judged Israel. Then underlined, he went. So he judged and he went. He went out to war. Then I want you to underline, the Lord delivered. Those three things. He judged, he went, the Lord delivered. And here's what I want you to see before you go home tonight. That this ordinary person, Othniel, who had these ordinary circumstances in life that God extraordinarily chose to use, but God didn't just show up to Othniel and just wave his magic wand over his head and then this story happened where suddenly he reigns for 40 years and the people are at peace and everything just works out and now we're reading the story in the Bible. That's not, it's not what happened. And we saw this with Moses at the burning bush, the same principle that you'll see repeated over and over and over in Scripture. God calls a person. In other words, remember the burning bush moment. Here's Othniel's burning bush. God puts his spirit on him first. God brings a burning bush first. Then Othniel responds. In other words, he begins to judge Israel. He accepts the call. Whether how willingly or unwillingly he does that, Lord, I don't know. I can't, I'm not good. I can't speak. I've got a weak tongue. I'm, I'm afraid. I don't. But he does this. And he goes to war. And then God then. And this is where I think we get the train goes off the track for us. Is that we so many times feel like we're not usable for whatever reason. We don't see the potential that God can use us as his tool for his glory. And so here's what we do. We sit put. And we don't move. And so what happens if Othniel doesn't judge? What happens if he doesn't go to war? Remember I said earlier, he went to war. Not just any war. Do you know of all the judges, interestingly enough, who is the most famous judge? If you even, if anyone knows anything about the book of Judges at all, the only name that anyone ever knows is Samson. Who's the biggest loser in the whole book? Who's a moron? He goes against the Philistines who are like some chump tribe. This nobody guy goes against the world dominant power. You understand? The most impossible odds. When the Bible makes the phrase, he went out to war, you have no idea of, of how catastrophic that is. He went out to war. He went out to war again in, in an unwinnable situation, but he did it. And then God delivered him. So you know, we're, we see people, man, this, that's what makes this church so awesome is that we see people here every week go out to war, don't you? Yes. They go out to war. I, I watch people do the most scary things here every single week. And they're doing they're like, God, I, if, if you don't do this, I don't know. This morning, I'm driving to work. I get a phone call. Single lady in our church calls me on my phone. Pastor. Let me update you on what's going on. No husband, by herself, trying to make ends meet. Goes through training, gets trained, is a licensed foster worker. Been serving at the uh, children's village up there at the orphanage since day one. And has been praying, God, there's two children up there that I've built a bond with that I believe the Lord has put us together that we're going to that, that I'm going to be able to adopt these children. Now, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about fostering. I'm talking about adopting. I'm talking about a single, I've never been married, young lady, that the, this is a scary world on top of everything else, bringing two kids in, not getting a check every month, just bringing these kids in and saying, I'm going to be your mom. I've never been a mom, but I'm going to be your mom. And there's no way this is going to happen. Then the, the, the odds are all stacked against her, but she keeps believing. The last conversation I had, I said, you know, we're just going to keep praying. We start praying. 
praying, 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 praying. God starts moving, orchestrating things. Suddenly, the caseworker that's telling her, you can't adopt these two kids because that's not going to work. It's never going to happen. Suddenly, she gets, she gone. New person comes in. Yeah, I think we could do this. But here's the thing. In order for that to happen, you, you live in a, a, a two bedroom house. You gotta have a three, be- you gotta have three bedrooms. It's a boy and a girl. You don't have three bedrooms. I mean, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. How am I gonna do that? Now this isn't me, Pastor Tony, going, oh, he of little faith. You need to step out on the plank and just do this. No, this is her telling me what she's already done. She's like, I already went down and put myself on the waiting list to get a three bedroom home. I'm like, okay. What happens if you get that home? She's like, I don't know, because I'm still under the lease where I am now. So I would have to pay two rents, which that's impossible. But she's already done it. Don't you understand? She already did it. She's like, I'm just doing, she's going to war against Mesopotamia. I'm driving to war going, here you are going to war against Mesopotamia right here in this church. Every week it happens. Othniel. The whole world's like, you're just a kid, you're just a girl, you're just somebody, you're just a face in the crowd. Don't you ever think, you better think, who might be sitting in front of you, behind you, to the left of you, the right? There are world shakers here. I'm telling you, I am in awe of their faith. I am in awe of their courage. Othniel's. Every single day, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. It is shocking. Do never think that he won't use you. Never. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've come upon us. And the Lord, we can go to war. God, we can, we can do the things that you've called us to do. We can go to war against what the world says we can't do. We can go to war against injustice, Lord. We can go to war and serve. We can go to war and be a, 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 a help me, a sounding board. God, we can be a, a support team. We can, we can pray. We can go to war in our prayer closet. Lord, thank you for that. God, we're humble tonight at what you do around us every day to remind us of how you delight to use the foolish things of the world to confound the wisdom that's all around us thinking it's so wise when in fact it has no idea of who you are. So thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. Guys, we only need to pick up the chairs, not the table.